deeper causes for leadership are, for automatic leadership. We're talking about the kind of leader who everyone just automatically is attracted to and has a magnetism. So I'm really happy to be able to tell you that the cause for leadership is enjoying what you do. Before we get into the qualities of enjoying what you do and how are we going to do that, I want to take you through a few of an ancient teacher named Nagarjuna's correlations. What a correlation is, is if you do this, then you get that. Because we showed you the pen and the four steps, hopefully we've got you thinking about this idea that what we do, what we do creates what's going to happen in the future. It's a basic reap what you sow kind of concept. It's not a new idea to most of you probably, but for many people, we haven't really committed to this idea and we're not using it in our lives as much as we could be. So talking about the correlations is gonna help you with that. Nagarjuna taught these in 200 AD. The first one we already talked about with Devon's help. If you want prosperity, you have to share what you have with others, or we invite you to share what you have with others. You don't have to do anything, and you certainly don't have to believe this. The best way to find out if this is true is to try it. So if you want prosperity, we recommend you try sharing what you have with others. This can be um, your time, your attention, as well as material things. And it doesn't have to be a $100 bill, and it doesn't have to be anything big. The tip jar at the coffee joint is a great place to practice this. Throw in an extra quarter, more than you would maybe, and then at night before you go to bed, remember to replay that in your mind, that you shared that extra quarter, because that's the water that's gonna create the seed to grow strongly. The next one is that if you want happiness, then be kind to other people. This one and the last one are pretty simple, obvious correlations. If I want to be happy, you're going to be making other people happy. Other people are happy when you're helping them with things, when you're um, helping them to protect their belongings, when you're helping them to get what they want, when you're helping them to uh, be safe, and when you're speaking kindly to them, things like that. If we're yelling at people, if we're stealing from them, obviously we're going to be creating upset in their lives and you're not going to be happy. So this third one is a little bit more of a hidden correlation. These first two are pretty obvious. The third one is about beauty. We all want to be beautiful. Maybe we don't really think of it like that, but there's an inner beauty which is going to help us to be good leaders too, that a kind of um, radiance. And what would that come from? Lancome makeup and getting some extra nice clothes. No, the correlation here is patience, not getting angry. If you think about that, if you know anybody who has anger issues, I think most of us probably have met somebody who gets angry easily and it creates this um, cycle of negativity. When we can be patient, and um, that doesn't mean just putting up with things that you don't like. It means being able to have some wisdom and be able to um, know that the thing that's making you angry, for one thing, is coming from what you did in the past. That's one of the best ways to break an anger cycle. But to know that we're all in it together, we all have problems, and if some, somebody or something makes you angry, it's a temporary situation that's going to pass. We're going to skip number four and go to number five. If you want peace of mind, then you need to learn how to focus. This could be in the form of meditation practice or some type of concentration practice. You probably have had the experience as I have this week, when you have so many different things going on that your mind is just split into a lot of different directions and you're having a lot of agitation. When we can get our mind to slow down and become more focused on one thing, then we begin to develop peace. 
and a kind of peace that eventually cannot be broken. Six is that if you want freedom, you have to understand where things are coming from. That's because when we understand where things are coming from, then we can create what we want. And we're free. We're not a victim of circumstances. We don't just have to wait for things to happen to us. We can start taking an active role and start designing our life. And that gives us ultimate freedom. Number seven is one of the best because it gives you everything you ever wanted. That's love. Love brings you everything you ever wanted. Now we're going to go back to number four because it's a topic for today. If you want to be an electrifying leader, then you need to enjoy what you do. When I heard this, I really was so happy because I knew that enjoying life was an important quality, but it's honestly been elusive for me. I haven't just had this natural joy and bubbly joy that I've heard about, but you can't just make yourself joyful. But when I heard that if I could become more joyful, it would enable me to help others because I would be able to be a better leader and I could lead them to a better place, I was relieved that it wasn't just a selfish thing being joyful, that it would be something that could really help other people. So it motivated me to want to try a little bit harder. I grew up in a situation where enjoyment was not one of the things that was emphasized. So here I'd like to bring this back to you and your children, your families, and your friends. Give people permission to be joyful. My mother had a more of a puritanical kind of idea that there was something that we could contribute to society, but it was like a sacrifice. We would make a contribution, but by doing that, we would not be happy ourselves. And she told me that being happy was not a useful goal. I tried to live my life that way for about 30, 40 years, and then um, I respectfully disagree. <laughs> and just really in the last few years, I've realized that being happy and enjoying life is one of the most important things I can do. And in order to do it, I've got to follow my passion. I've got to do what makes me happy, right? If we're forcing ourselves to do things we don't want to do, careers we don't like, jobs we don't like, then it's going to be hard to be joyful. So this gives us permission to follow our hearts and to encourage the people around you and the children around you to do what they're good at and what they like. And honestly, I think this is one of the reasons that Mariah, my daughter, has this quality of automatic leadership. is because I was raised one way, which was to do what someone else thought I should be doing. And then I really wanted my kids to do what they wanted to do. And so I really tried to support them without knowing the diamond cutter system at that time. But I really tried to encourage them to investigate what they loved and to give them the space and time to do what they love. So this is my biggest tip for you today about how to help your children or the children around you or the people around you to develop leadership qualities for automatic leadership. Here's our problem. Just wanting to be joyful doesn't work. You can't force yourself to be joyful. So Master Shanti Deva is another teacher from 700 AD and he has some suggestions for us from the Asian classics. There are three kinds of laziness, lazinesses, that can be obstacles to our joy. So we're going to just take a look at these three lazinesses and you see if you can identify these in your life. And you'll also be able to see areas where maybe the children around you are stuck in some of these lazinesses. The first one, and I don't know if they're on the slide, I apologize. Oh, there are. Something is here. <laughs> The first one is called laying around laziness. This is when you just zone out or you sleep too much. It's what we think of as being lazy, just kind of lying around in a dull state. How can we get ourselves out of that? The, the remedy for this kind of a dullness and a lack of zest for life is to recall that life is passing. When you get to be my age, this is not so difficult because 
people around you start getting sick, and you do start to realize that we don't have an unlimited amount of time here. What would you like to accomplish while you're here? And even if you're young, as many of you in this room are, we just don't know how much time we have. It's really time to get to it. Okay? Quit fooling around, get off the couch, and do with your life what you're passionate about and what you want to do. Don't wait. So that's going to get us out of the laying around laziness. So just remind yourself, if you see that you're wasting time, that time is short. The next one is called low priority laziness. This is when, as all of you in this room, you're good people, you have a lot of good ideas of things you want to do. Traditionally, this was taught as maybe you were doing something very negative, like, should I go out and get drunk, or should I go to work today? Then you would choose go to work today. <laughs> but what happens to us is we get caught up in trying to do a lot of different good things, so many good things, that we're too busy and our attention is scattered. We're trying to help uh, our friend by making them a cake. We're trying to do a Diamond X talk. We're trying to get everything done at work. And ultimately, multitasking is not the best way to use your energy. So for low priority laziness, again, it's time to pick what you're passionate about, what's most important to you, and narrow your focus. Remember that focus is also a way to get peace of mind. The third kind of laziness is called I can't do it laziness. Usually we don't think of this as laziness, but this is something that stops us from getting started. We have a great idea, or there's something that we want to do, but we start talking ourselves out of it before we even start trying, because maybe we don't have the education or the training or we don't know who can help us. There's no group of people to support us. So we get afraid, and we just don't try. So we're going to call this a kind of laziness because it stops you from doing what you're passionate about. So these are three obstacles and three ways to help your joy level. And by you helping your joy level, you're going to be a leading, uh, living example, leading other people, leading your children, but you'll also be watching in your children for these kinds of um, obstacles to come up, and then you can help them. You can help give them these techniques. It's important that we start small, because that um, I can't do it laziness, sometimes that comes from having such a big idea that we don't know how to break it into smaller pieces. There's an idea that what's the fastest way to eat an elephant in little bites. So let's not give ourselves a task that's impossible and just start small. Like that quarter in the tip jar. Maybe you want to make a million dollars in the next 12 months. That's not a crazy goal. People have done that. A lot of people have done that. But if you don't start small, you might get discouraged before you start. So we call that give carrots and potatoes because that's what Shanti Deva said back in uh, 700 AD, when people were farming <laughs> back in Asia, he's like, well, just take your neighbor a potato. Just start like that, okay? So when you're thinking about what you want to do, start small. And the most important thing is that you're a living example for the people around you. So if you can find joy in your life, then it's going to be contagious. Janice is going to help us uh, learn some practical qualities of a leader next. Thank you, Alex. Here's your. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Alex just um, gave us the big key that's going to make us into a leader, um, and that's joyful effort. But we'll need more than just to be a leader. What if we're a leader and no one listens to us? What's the point of being a leader? So, if you want to become a leader who listens to your ideas, for instance, I like to think of this story that actually Yeshi Michael told. He, um, he had the suggestion, he worked in this diamond industry, right, and in international, and he had a great idea, you know, of how to save money, because when they're cutting the diamonds on these wheels, diamonds, of little chips would fall off here, fly off everywhere. So he suggested that they put these mats in the elevators, that when, you know, because diamond dust would get everywhere, little chips of diamond. 
So put these mats in the elevator, and then they would, the diamond little chips would get scraped off their shoes, maybe they would shake their clothes out, and then they could vacuum up the little diamond chips from these mats within the elevator. Well, everyone at the conference room thought it was a really dumb idea because he didn't have the seeds for it to be accepted as a good idea. It's back to that, what are the qualities of a leader? So we're going to get to what's the quality and what the seeds are to have people actually listen to you. So then a week later, someone else came in and had an idea that maybe, you know, saving money by cutting down on the chocolate bars they gave their clients at the end of the year, making them a lot smaller. And everybody thought that was a good idea. Well, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But the bottom line is, how do you get people to listen to you when you really do have a good idea? And it all comes from our speech. What we hear ourselves saying makes a difference in what people are going to be listening to us. So if I have, if I waste your time just talking about stupid things or um, not meaningful subjects, I just waste your time gossiping about something that I saw someone else doing, well, that's not only meaningless speech, it's also divisive. Because when you hear somebody say something about someone else, you get an opinion of them. And when you meet them, you may not like them just based on what somebody told you. Or if you waste time just talking about some, perhaps you binge on the internet watching television shows. I've done that. And then you start, you go to work and you start telling people about this television show or internet movie that you've seen. You're wasting their time. It's not interesting. Nobody really cares. So you want to have meaningful speech. You want to avoid gossip and criticism. And that will plant the seeds for people to listen to you. And if you want to be believed, it's really important that you tell the truth. Telling the truth really matters. Because if you exaggerate or don't really say, tell, say things as they are, it plants a seed for people not to believe you even when you're telling the truth. And I have a problem with exaggeration. I like to exaggerate. I like to tell stories. I like to make them bigger than they are. So recently, I've had to be reined in. <laughs> uh, I, I mentioned that I have uh, businesses in Silverton and Durango. And I was talking about what my eclectic group of employees were like in Silverton. And I think they're amazing, so I was kind of bragging about them. And I was saying, one of them went to medical school, another of them has a PhD in paleontology, another was a university professor. Well, you know what? I was kind of stretching the truth. No one went to medical school. They went to physical therapy school. I don't have a PhD paleontologist. I have a PhD entomologist. And um, the college professor taught at a junior college. So, you know, I was stretching the truth a little bit, but it sure sounded like fun. But if I want to be believed, if I have an important message that I want you to receive and hear, then I really need to not exaggerate and state things as they are, to tell the truth. So I can have you believe when, I t when I'm teaching that I've had this success from these tools, and I want you to be able to use them and understand that they're going to be beneficial for you, for you too. So that's the how to get people to listen to you. Because it's not enough to be a leader if you can't tell them what they need to know to get to where they need to be. All right, and another good quality of a leader is decisiveness. In order to be decisive, again, you know, it, it relates to speech. Because if you're not telling the truth, if you're exaggerating, if you're wasting time with meaningless talk, you're, you're, not, you're gonna lose your decision-making capability and you're gonna lose your confidence. So if you're lagging in confidence in any area, you might want to look to what your speech looks like and clean it up. Just pay attention to it, give it a try. Now, another technique for decisiveness now is um, just, there's using the four steps, and I'm gonna, I like to tell stories, as I mentioned. And in the past, I was a real Star Trek fan, and I would binge watch it. But I'm, I'm gonna use this for a good purpose. I'm not gonna try to make it meaningless. James T. Kirk, the captain of the Starship Enterprise, has to be decisive. He is a leader. Everybody accepts him as a leader. And if he doesn't know what to do in a split second, they could be bombarded by Klingons at any second. 
or they could go into a black hole. So if James T. Kirk is in a situation where the Klingons, I agree. Thank you, Ava. If the Klingons are attacking, if the Klingons are attacking in this course, and over here he has a black hole, where, what's he going to do? He's got two bad choices, but he has to be decisive right now. But if he has planted the seeds in a four-step plan of helping others get out of tough situations, then he's going to have the ability to make those quick decisions. He's going to use, he's going to have the ability to see option number three, which is he's going to put that starship into warp drive and he's going to go to another galaxy where there's no Klingons and no black holes. So we can use the four steps, and that, and that involves helping somebody else get what they want, safety. So if James C. Kirk is planting the seeds using the four steps, he's got option three in hand, and he has decisive this now, and he's going to save his crew. Or another way to use the four steps is to use the coffee meditation part of it. Let's say, for instance, that um, I am planning a trip. I'm planning a trip with my granddaughter, my family, and we're going to go away for the weekend. But I've been working on it. I've been trying to get a new product into my stores. And I've been working on it for about a year. And this actually happened. I wanted to sell fudge in one of my stores. And I was really working to try to um, get the account so that I could sell fudge. And it took about a year. But right when the rep that was selling the fudge product and the fudge machine was coming into town, it was the very weekend that I was going to take my family camping. And I thought to myself, well, I really want this because I think it would really improve a section of my store and bring people into it to buy other things as well. So what do I do? It's the weekend that I was going to take my family on a camping trip, and the fudge rep was finally going to come to Silverton and see me and maybe allow me to have this in my store. So I wondered what to do. And then I started remembering all the times that I helped somebody else get off work early. I took, I worked, um, I worked overtime so that someone could leave early, or I took their shift so that they could have a long weekend, or that I even um, allowed them time off and worked extra so that they could have a whole week off. And I started watering those seeds. Because as Alex taught us when she presented the four steps, coffee meditation is a very important part of the four steps. And we can bring up old seeds and water those to get the results we need now. So even though those seeds were old, I started watering them, thinking about all the people that I've helped. And because seeds grow, I got results. I got option number three. I got the whole next week off because some of my employees at that time said that they would manage, you know, talking to the rep. I had a, a, a person there named Skip that had worked for me for a long time, and he wanted to learn how to use this equipment. So he agreed to meet with the rep and he agreed to work the whole next week off with off for me, I mean for me, so that I could take my family camping for a full week. So that was my option three, and it came from watering those old seeds. So those are set as techniques that you guys can use too, and I hope you do. Don't take my word for it. Please try it yourself. And that brings us to the next part of this. Um, oh, clicker. <laughs> um, there are different styles of leadership. There are actually three. There's probably more than that, but the three that we want to address today. Three styles of leadership. There's the king, the ferryman, and the shepherd. If you want to be a leader who acts like a king, that means you charge out in front of the whole team. You're the type of leader who sees a team, and, and perhaps this team, the type of people that for a king to be a leader, you actually have a team that is maybe not as experienced. They, they're new. They're new to your team, and you have to guide them. You have to take the charge and the lead. You have to give them an assignment. You have to actually watch them to make sure that they, can, they complete the assignment to the, how you like it done. And in my situation, it's like um, checking in inventory. If I have new employees and they're going to check in inventory, then I'm a king and I'm right there watching them, making sure they fold the shirts how I like them, making sure that they check off the invoices the, 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 the way I like, making sure that when I go back through those, I can read them. So I'm there watching them. I give them an assignment, but I watch every step that they do. 
and that makes me the king. They follow me, they follow my guy. Now the seeds to be that type of leader is um, I have to have them trust me that I will take them to a better place where we don't have to worry about the problems in the future, you know, with bad shirts that we'll have customers bringing up shirts with tears or damages because they've inspected them. So that means that I have to be the type of leader that gives, um, I create their trust in me by giving trust to the people around me, like uh, my partners or my business partners or my families. I trust them to keep their commitments and that plants the seed for these employees to trust me as their leader. The next type of leadership is the ferryman. And I like to think about a ferryman on the Mississippi River about 200 years ago. You'd come to one side and you'd get on his boat with the ferryman, this leader, a team of equals, and you would go from the start to the finish together. That would be like me working with my team, working hand in hand. And actually, that's the type of leader I mostly am. I like working with the people. We're all pretty much equals. We understand our goals. So we're kind of, I lead like a ferryman. I work with my team. I start with them and I finish with them. And the seed to have that sort of leadership style is you have to be a real team player. This dance team, for example, if, I, if that dance team has one person missing, it's going to be a problem, you know? Somebody's going to fall over when they do that lean. You have to show up. You have to be present. I think she's locked out. Okay. <laughs> you have to show up. <laughs> and you, you have to fill your spot. And that, when you show up and you keep your commitments to your team, for instance, a band. Ben is in a, ben is in a band, and if he counts on a percussion player being there, and the percussion player doesn't show up, then the band doesn't have uh, the rhythm that they might need. So you need to actually show up and support your team members. And that'll plant the seeds for it to become a good leader as a ferryman. And finally, it's a shepherd. Now one day I really want to be a good shepherd. The shepherd style of leadership is when you give the responsibilities over to your team. Your team is a well-seasoned group of people. You trust them to know what you want, and you trust them to accomplish it. And that can be risky because you're turning everything over to them. And I've had some good results with that. I tried it this summer. I, um, I, I was uh, away from work for a while, and um, my team handled it very well. I have a very seasoned, knowledgeable crew who even did better than I would have if I'd been there. And a couple of them are here today. Thank you very much. Yeah, they did a great job. So the shepherd leadership style, when you're leading from behind, trusting your team to take care of all the details, the seeds to get that type of leadership is keeping your commitments and trusting others you know, with theirs. And if you know somebody who has some, that they're giving the responsibility in a ris risky business away, that you help them. You help them reduce their risk. Or maybe you just meet with them in a four-step plan help keep them calm. It plants a seed for you to be able to leave from behind and not have to be there all the time. Become a good shepherd. Now, what type of leadership might you guys be? Um, we all have one that we probably are stronger in. Like I said, I'm stronger in the ferryman type of leadership. But it's really good to have all three types of leadership because there's times when you can have a new crew come on. Or, you know, um, your team members, if you've really supported them, they've moved up and they're with a, they've moved into bigger positions and you have new people that you want to lead. Then you're the king. Or if you're the ferryman and you're working with a crew that is seasoned and like equals. Or if you want to get that shepherd type. It's really good to learn all types of those leaderships. And, um, if you want to be a really good leader, we've learned some of the tools. We've learned that joyful effort is the thing that'll make you into being recognized as a leader. We've learned some qualities of a leader, how to have people listen to you and to do what they say. But now, we're gonna learn the seed to become not only a leader, but a really great leader. And I welcome Alex back up here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everybody. I get to teach the fun things in this class today, I feel like. I, I love this subject about joy, 
and have enjoyed in what you do as being the deep cause of being recognized as a leader. And we call that automatic leadership. Maybe you saw Nagarjuna talked about electrifying leadership. The reason we call it electrifying is because it's like a big cloud, a big thunderhead. It builds up, builds up, and then the lightning that comes down is the automatic result. And that's the way causes work. You gather the causes together, and the result is automatic. So we've talked about how to be seen as a leader, but what if you become a leader and you don't lead people to a better place? We see this in our world around us, in maybe corporations, politics, schools, in businesses. There are leaders who are not taking a group of people to a better place, which is our definition for leadership today. How do we become great leaders that can really do that? The seed for that is equal right to success. Equal right to success means that every person in the group that you're leading has the exact same right to success that you yourself have. Leaders sometimes feel that they have a lot of responsibility, a burden to get a project done, to make sure that the family gets out of bed. I remember those days. Out of bed, breakfast, clothes. You have this responsibility to keep things moving. And because of all of those tasks that you're trying to achieve, benchmarks that you're trying to get to, like get the kids to school on time, we sometimes forget about the needs of the other people around us, or worse, we feel that our needs are more important because we're the responsible one. The leader can get a type of um, feeling like their priorities are more important because they are the leader. So in this tool, we say that that is not the case Every member, no matter how small or how young in the room, has equal, or equal right to success. So Ava's right to be comfortable in here today is just as important as anybody else's. Another problem that comes up when we think about equal right to success is that I am already doing so many things. How am I going to have the time to think about what other people want? Shantideva has an answer to that. So we're going to go back to Shantideva from 700 AD. If you think that you don't have the time to take care of the needs of the other people around you, that's like saying, he says, that your hand doesn't have time to take care of your foot. Well, we know that the hand is going to wash the foot in the shower. And if you get a thorn in your foot, you're going to reach down and pull that thorn out. So you might say, well, it's different because the hand and the foot are part of one thing. The hand and the foot are part of one organism. But your group is also one organism. Not only because we're all in it together, as my father was very fond of saying, but also because where do the people in your group come from? And where do their problems and their dreams come from? Well, we already learned from the pen that the people around you and their personalities and their dreams are coming from what you did in the past, too. So in a very real way, we're all in it together. So if my hand can reach down and pull a thorn out of my foot, then I also, as a leader, will take the time to help a teammate with a problem that they have on the team. Because if one person on the team has a problem, then the whole team is gonna suffer. Just like if your foot gets gangrene and they have to cut off your leg, it's gonna be a problem for the whole body, right? So think of that when you're feeling like it might be too hard to think about other people's needs. The other thing that I've noticed from using this technique of equal right to success is that it gets easier. I have a habit of thinking about myself, and that's a very strong habit. I've been doing it for a long time. But when I start to open my eyes and look at the people around me and think about what they might need, that habit just starts to grow, and it gets a little bit easier all the time. And then it gets to be fun that I can be thinking about what my teammate might like for her birthday, 
which was unicorn snot. Uh, or, uh, but that's, that's glitter, in case you don't know. <laughs> uh, so it becomes really fun to start being able to, and it doesn't take that much effort, to start thinking about what the people around you would enjoy, what would make their day happier, or what you could do to help them overcome a problem. And you heard me say that that was also something that you're going to enjoy. And that's the thing about these deep causes, is that they kind of build up together. So this is the cause to be a great leader, is to care about other people. But when you do that, you're going to enjoy your life more. And that's the cause to be an automatic leader. So the causes start gathering together and helping each other. So enjoyment doesn't just become something that you do once in a while, or on your day off or during your lunch break, or when you have uh, some time to do something for yourself. It becomes something that you do all the time. And equal right to success also becomes something you just start automatically thinking about all the time. Now, there's one more thing that we'd like to cover today. We've talked about what it is to be an automatic leader. That there's surface causes for leadership, but they don't guarantee that you'll be a leader. You can go to the best school, you can get an MBA, you can go to parenting classes. Doesn't mean your kids are going to listen to you. So we know that there's deeper causes, and we talked about those deeper causes. Janice gave us some of the um, qualities of a leader. In the very intro, we had knowing, caring, and strength. And then we also had some qualities of decisive speech, um, speech that people will listen to and also being able to make decisions. The different types of leadership, three different types of leadership that we all could become versed in each one so that we can jump in with a different style when it's needed. This last thought that we'd like to leave you with is now you have a group of people depending on you. They're looking towards you to lead them. But where are you going to lead them to? How are you going to know what a good place is to take them? In the diamond cutter system, we say that everybody has similar needs for shelter, food, to be happy, to have good relationships, sex is what they say. There's these driving forces behind humanity that we all share. But there is one quality that we all want that they say is even more important than any of those things. And that is this inner desire to be able to help the world, to be able to make a difference. And I think you, you know that that's true. And that's why your kids run around in capes and pretend to be superheroes. You know, everybody wants to help. So that's what we're going to lead people towards. We're going to lead people towards something that's going to help others and help the world be a better place. We'll start small with carrots and potatoes, mm -hmm. but this will, be your, this will be your test of whether what you're leading is something worth following. We also talked about leadership being important so that um, your children are not following someone down a negative path. If you're, if you're not a leader and you don't have good ideas about taking people to something worth following, it's likely that you might be like I was as a teenager, and that is following the worst kids in the neighborhood down some dark road. Right? So it's important that we have something worth following and we have the skills to be good leaders. So Janice and I are going to do some question and answer before we finish up today. We'll be letting you out early. Those are, what are the three qualities? This is my first question. Janice, what are the three qualities of a good instructor? Um, know, your, know your students' names, know your topic well, and let them out early. Exactly. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Good, we covered, we covered the topic well. Cool. Yeah, so the most important thing is that you know that there's deep causes, and you start thinking about what those deep causes are. Can you go over just really briefly the, um, how to overcome the obstacles to laziness? Sure. Let's talk about the obstacles to laziness one more time. The first obstacle was the lying around laziness, this just dullness and a lack of enthusiasm 
Does anybody remember what the, um, the antidote is for that? Recall that life is passing. <laughs> yes. Recall that life is passing quickly and you better get on it before it just goes by and you have regrets. You know, you look back on your life and you regret that you didn't do what you wanted to do. Then the second clause is called low priority laziness. This is a type of busyness where we're just so scattered, going every which direction that we're not, um, you know, we're not focusing on what is really bringing us joy. And what's the antidote for that one? Be more compassionate about and narrow your focus. Exactly. Yeah. And then the third kind is uh, what's it called? I can't do it. I can't do it laziness. And that is feeling discouraged before you even start. And what's the antidote for that one? Devin's got it. Deep the elephant one bite at a time. Just, just start small and break your larger, or larger ideas up into smaller bits. Uh huh. That's one good. Any, anything else? Not be afraid. Uh huh. And how can we not be afraid? Just try. Just try. And maybe I forgot to say, remember the pen. Because oh, we're okay. creating our future. So it's not fixed. Maybe this is why Katie asked me to review this. <laughs> this very important key point is that if we, if we think the future is already fixed and that um, whether we succeed or fail is coming from outside of ourselves, then we're going to be afraid to try. But if we know that what we do today, every day, and what we, what we think about at night during our coffee meditation is going to create the causes for our future, then we're not going to be afraid. We know we can do a lot more than we can do. Yeah. Thank you for that great question, Katie. I was wondering about how can we um, you know, assist in preventing meaningless speech or participating in without being like rude and um, you know uninterested. Um, one way to do it is, I've heard, <laughs> is if you're in a situation like that and you want to change the subject quickly, you create a distraction like, maybe, you know, you really don't want to create that kind of stuff in your life, so you drop a cup. You drop a cup. You, uh... Pick up a baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you pick up a baby. You create a distraction, a diversion. So it, then, it, you know, go, oh, 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 I, I've got to keep that up. And then you can excuse yourself from it. And that's one way to stop it. Okay. And then actually, the more you start with your meaningful speech, and the more you avoid gossip and that sort of thing, it actually creates like a, a vortex that you stop hearing it. So the more, you know, so right away, you know, start with a distraction. And the more uh, you practice avoiding it, the less you're going to hear it. Okay. And your speech will become more meaningful. Thank you, Thank you very much. I would just add, um, not participating in it is really good. But there is a time where um, you're in a group of people and they're talking about football or something. And it's actually, um, people are bonding right. and they're helping to have common ground and feel more comfortable. So you have to be discerning as to whether this speech, would, which maybe isn't meaningful to you, might be meaningful to the group to bond together, feel more comfortable. Except you as a member of the group, <laughs> yeah, the person who sits in the corner or something. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I think you're going to close. Yeah. yeah. Take us up. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. This was very important for us because we've tried these techniques. We know they work. But unless you try them yourselves, you won't know they work. So my question to you is, what if? What if you tried the four steps? What if you help someone else reach their goal? That's the only way that you're going to reach your goal. The four steps is meant for you to help someone reach their goal by it reach their goal so that you can reach your own. And we're talking about our children. We want to become living examples for our children and maybe the children that we don't have, but we, we care about other people's children. If we become living examples by helping other people succeed, teaching other parents to be leaders, then we're planting the seeds to have see more and more leaders. And when we use the diamond cutter system, the system that gives to others the very things that we want, we're starting to create one by one a world that can change the whole world, one person at a time. So I encourage you not to take my word for it, 
but to just do it yourself. And just remember what the steps are for leadership. Joyful effort. I really like that one. I've even started being joyful in traffic. <laughs> because I'm driving and I'm making an effort. And I, I have commuted between Durango and Silverton and Durango and Uray since 1989. And it's only since I started in this uh, coursework that I've slowed down, you know, and not get, gotten irritated because a big RV is slowing my path. Instead, I've noticed different mountain ranges that I had never seen before because I've had to slow down and appreciate what's at hand. So we can make joyful effort wherever we're at, even if it seems like a meaningless task, task like doing the dishes. I really like doing the dishes now. I do them all the time. <laughs> so joyful effort plants the seed for us to be seen as a leader. And then if you listen to as a leader, we know those seeds. You know, watch our speech. And it's just, we can change the world one person at a time when we start using these techniques. But I implore you, don't take my word for it. Our purpose today is to get you all to try it. And um, we're going to have a little sign-up sheet. If you guys would put your emails, we're going to check back with you in, what is it, 10 days? Yeah. In 10 days to see how you're doing, to see if you've applied any of these. And, you know, please respond if you get a chance. So thank you all again. We so appreciate you being here. It means a lot to us. Thank you very much.